Meet Nikolai Karpand. In 1986, he was the deputy chief of the nuclear safety department, vital to the liquidation efforts of the Chernobyl disaster following the explosion of Unit 4. But this is not that story, and this is not Karpan's first experience with an accident at Chernobyl. In 1982, at the end of summer, Karpan bore witness to the partial meltdown of Unit 1. Behind this accident lies a story of cover-up and scapegoating. So let's peel back the layers and examine what really happened one afternoon in September. It was the 9th of September 1982, and Unit 1 was already coming out of a very difficult maintenance period, which I may cover in the future. But it was over, and it was time to restart Unit 1 and reconnect it to the grid. Between 5 and 6 pm that evening, the reactor was at roughly 700 megawatts, and the turbines were about to be run up and synchronised with the grid. In the past 10 minutes, they had risen it from just 250 megawatts. Suddenly, something unusual happened in the core. What none of them realised was that the zirconium channel 1644 had heated up by hundreds of degrees Celsius in the last few minutes, swelling, bulging into the graphite, and then cracking two blocks near the top the contact ring surrounding the channel, pulling it apart, and creating a long gash down the length of the top of the channel. Nuclear fuel was now exposed. Before the channel had ruptured, some of the nuclear fuel had already deformed and broken free from the channel, being carried all the way up into the steam separator. Afterwards, the fuel and superheated steam instead began to pour into the graphite stack itself, which began to erode it all the way. But the senior reactor control engineer, nor anyone else in the control room, didn't react significantly to this. They had no way of knowing, and the shutdown systems for an increased pressure in the reactor core did not exist. The humidity alarm for the graphite stack did not function. They simply continued to raise the power. Back in the core, the madness unfolding simply grew more severe. All but the bottom meter of the fuel channel had been ripped up and poured straight into the graphite, eroding away a massive section of the stack. At this point, the last meter broke loose and was carried up through the channel, out the growing tear in the zirconium and forced down into the graphite, wedging it there. Finally, the operators realised that continuing to operate the reactor like this was impossible. The conditions inside the core were unsustainable, with the local area completely out of control. And so they made the decision to shut down the reactor. AZ-5. Control rods entered the core, and it was safely shut down. Initial reports indicated that the damage would take just five days to repair, but this was obviously not going to be the case. They just didn't know what they were dealing with. Five became ten when they removed the top of the channel and used a periscope to look into the core. Ten was still not enough. Meanwhile, not knowing the severity of the amount of fuel now in the graphite stack, and in the steam separators, the gas and water flow still passed through these areas, carrying with it radioactive contamination that was vented out of the giant ventilation tower protruding in front of the reactor building. This radiation rained back down on the city of Pripyat for weeks after the disaster. Street cleaners were brought in to hose down the roads, the buildings were cleaned, but the overall harm to the public was negligible. Most radiation emissions were confined to the plant, especially the switchyard south of the building, or the immediate area surrounding it, which was considered a no-build zone. A lucky break, all things considered. 
After subsequent investigations, the official report into what happened during the accident delivered some very unique findings, according to Nikiat. Apparently, the sudden superheating of the core falls down to two men who were controlling the flow of water to the reactor, in the shut-off and control valve suite. The flow to channel 1644 had been fluctuating, so they decided to manually control it as the power was raised, which was already a violation of procedure, as it should have been done before the power was raised. Unfortunately, the two engineers twisted the valve the wrong way, so instead of opening the valve and allowing water to flow through the channel, they closed it. The flow rate should have been 20 to 24 tonnes per hour. They had closed it down to 0.4 to 0.5 for about 20 minutes. With the lack of water flowing into the channel, there was nothing to cool down the fuel rod as the power rapidly ramped up. It deformed at 7 to 800 degrees Celsius and ruptured. It's a simple and logical explanation that has been repeated across the board everywhere. From books published by Nikiat to most YouTube videos that cover this accident. Now, those who were there to witness the accident, Carpan included, are very hesitant to subscribe to this series of events. Not least to deny this are the two engineers blamed for the accident in the first place. Not only do they maintain that they followed the instructions, but they also used a regulator that would have prevented the closure of the channel. Some have claimed that an order was given by control room operators to deliberately close it, to see if the regulator was in place, but that seems very unusual, given they were trying to raise the power, and that they avoided any punishment. The reports into the accident by the nuclear power plant fail to mention this change in flow rate. Simply describing a channel rupture well into the 90s. What's even more interesting is the way that a Nikiat book describes the accident decades later, as a simple mistaken based accident. Contrasted to the treatment of operators after the 1975 Leningrad accident, where not only were they partially held at fault for the accident and demoted, but they also had to assist in the cleanup by cutting exposed fuel rods to extract them from the core. Many have speculated that there was a deliberate avoidance of placing blame to avoid a trial. The KGB never arrested or so much as accused someone of criminal negligence, despite monitoring the entire accident and repair process. Some people have suggested that what happened that evening was comparable to the Leningrad accident some seven years earlier. Being caught in a spiking neutron field when they ramped up the power that destabilised the channel, fueled to disastrous effects by a destabilising positive void coefficient. It's possible, but unlikely, unless there was something else that would make this channel in particular unique. This has never been found, and the theory of a runaway remains dead. Enter the Kachatov Institute, who were tasked with analysing the accident and came to very different conclusions. When investigating with the Department of Radiation Material Science of the Kyiv Institute of Nuclear Research, they analysed the zirconium channel itself and concluded that the issue was not with the closure of the channel, but the zirconium metal. The nuclear power plant, while constructing the reactor, had changed the engineering process to manufacture the pipes. Their so-called innovation had produced a defective channel. When the power of the reactor was ramped up so significantly, it could not handle the changing pressures and the temperatures and it buckled and failed at 230 degrees Celsius. So, these are the two versions. One blames operator error that has never been verified, and the other blames defective construction materials based on an erroneous manufacturing process. It is up to you, the viewer, 
to decide which one you believe to be the case. Regardless of whichever version of the accident is correct, the Soviets needed scapegoats. Both Nikit and the Kachatov Institute agreed on whom the main one would be. A scapegoat that better suited the Kachatov Institute's version of events. This was the chief engineer, Vyacheslav Akinfiev. He was demoted to deputy chief engineer. Losing his control over the power plant he had worked at since before the first concrete panels that made Unit 1 had been laid. With it, the employees he once oversaw also turned on him, and Akimfiev, already a very controversial figure, realised he was never going to get his old job back. His attempt to blame the deputy chief engineer beneath him failed, and the other deputy chief engineer for Units 3 and 4, Nikolai Fomin, received his position. Akimfiev tenured his resignation a few days later, and used connections in Moscow to earn a role at the Kozlodui nuclear power plant, which had recently expanded to its fourth unit. The departure of Akimfiev and promotion of Fomin created a new vacancy for the deputy chief engineer of units 3 and 4. There were only two people who seemed fit for the job, Nikolai Steinberg, the 35-year-old turbine operator turned shift supervisor for Unit 1, or Anatoly Dyatlov, the 52-year-old former reactor engineer at the Komsomol shipyards, now already working on the construction of the new units. The choice should have fallen to Viktor Brukhanov, and his choice was obvious. Steinberg, a competent, well-liked engineer, but the Ministry of Energy above had very different opinions. Dyatlov had something few people had. The ability to call on those who worked at the shipyards. And, unfortunately, anti-Semitic beliefs held strong. Steinberg was Jewish, Dyatlov was not. Dyatlov received the promotion. Steinberg and Dyatlov remained on good terms but it was obvious he had hit the ceiling in terms of work at Chernobyl. And Brukhanov knew this too. With glowing references, in early 1983, Steinberg transferred to the Balakovo nuclear power plant and worked his way up to deputy chief engineer there. Eight months after the accident, Unit 1 was finally restarted. The area surrounding the channel that had ruptured was never usable after the accident, causing a permanent limit to the power that Unit 1 could produce. <laughs>